Hebrews chapter 10. We'll read through our passage today and then we'll come back and kind of break it down, beginning in verse 26. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction and sometimes being partner with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, Do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. So this last week, I had an opportunity to accompany my father-in-law on a trip to climb Mount Shasta. It's one of those things that I've, I've wanted to do for many years and have avoided for a number of even reasons. Uh, one, because it just seemed like a lot of work. Uh, two, because I wasn't quite sure I was really prepared for what it would require. I wasn't sure I, w- I really had the knowledge or enough stamina. You see, Shasta stands out at 14,180 feet above sea level. Now, the route that we chose to take is called the Avalanche Gulch Route, and it's a 10.3 mile out and back, which doesn't sound necessarily like a whole lot, but you have to understand, you cut that in half because it's an out and back, so it's five miles to the summit, a little over five miles, and you gain 7,122 feet in those five miles. Now, we've been planning this trip since December, of last year, and my pack weighed in at 45 pounds. Now, that is after me repacking three different times and cutting virtually everything that I could think of to cut. I didn't bring spare underwear. I didn't do anything extra. It was like, we're going, and we're going to go as light as we possibly can. Uh, and on Monday... At 4.30 in the morning, we, we left from Medford, and when the, within the first two hours of climbing, my face got torched. It just got absolutely fried by the reflective UV rays coming off the snow because it was so bright out. And as we got within a mile of camp, we passed a guy who was, who was looking haggard, and he was wobbly. He didn't have a shirt on, and he was kind of a, a robust type of a fellow. His pack was, you know, sloppily put together and kind of cocked off to the side and he was stumbling just like down the mountain like, oh, you know, just absolutely worn out. We thought, for sure, this guy has been to the summit, right? There's no doubt. And so we said, hey, hey, what's it like up there? We're hoping to get a report uh, about the summit. He was shirtless. He was wearing 
not climbing shoes, but regular like summer type hiking boots. He had no crampons. He had no ice axe. A thin uh, sleeping pad, one of those small foam sleeping pads was attached to the outside of his his uh, backpack and, and his skin because he was wearing no shirt and he was being fried by the same sun resembled a, a, a slightly overdone ham at, at Easter time. And we looked at him, we, he said, hey, you know, how, how's, how is the, the summit? What, what, what it looked like up there? And uh, he said, nope, nope, didn't go to the summit. I, I didn't plan well for my trip. I, I didn't sleep well in the cold. The cold was coming up through my mat all night, and I, I couldn't hardly sleep, and I just, I just turned around, and I'm, I'm headed home. And we're like, oh, okay. Uh, safe travels. And we carried on. Now, we arrived at camp at around 2, and we set up for the night. Next morning, we made our way to the summit, and on the way, we encountered other people as well. These were people seeking to claim the summit as their prize. We encountered a group of six people. It was uh, three fathers and three daughters who were climbing to summit the mountain together as a father-daughter trip. I thought that was really cool. And uh, they, they were telling us of their trials on the way up. They, they ended up getting out a little bit late, and the snow softened, and so they were post holing which if you don't know, that's where you're sort of walking on the surface of the snow, and all of a sudden your leg just drops down to the knee or sometimes down to the waist because of the weight of your pack. And it is super exhausting to do that. They did that for two hours to get to base camp before they made their way to the summit. And so they were sharing, you know, their victory as we, as we crossed over onto the summit. They were slightly ahead of us. Then we passed a couple of 70-year-old uh, people. They were in their 70s, I should say. Um, they were well beyond what I thought was reasonable to climb it, and they told us they had climbed it many times and that they were just enjoying their day, <laughs> hiking slowly up the hill because they knew it would take them a little bit longer, and they were just sort of trucking along this elderly couple here and then we ran into this guy Isaiah now Isaiah had come from Monterey he works on a boat in Monterey and he made his way to the parking lot the day before at uh, at nine o'clock he caught two hours of sleep and then he woke up and 11 o'clock at night, he started hiking the mountain. Instead of camping like us to make it to the summit, he started out at 11 o'clock at night and hiked the entire journey with no rest. And he summited right alongside of us with us. Now, every person that made it to the summit had one thing in common. They just kept putting one foot in front of the other until they got there. The difference between the people on the top and the guy that we encountered the day before was that he turned around. Others did not. Each person who made it to the summit endured. They kept walking it out. Sometimes that is what life requires. One foot in front of the other, you just keep walking it out. A difficult marriage, a long season of dryness, financial hardships, sometimes you just, one foot in front of the other, you keep walking it out. I love what Angela Duckworth, the author of, of the book titled Grit, says. She says, enthusiasm is common, but endurance is rare. Albert Einstein famously once said, it is not that I am so smart. It's just that I stay with problems longer. I love that. Today in our passage, we encounter this same encouragement to endure from the author of Hebrews to his original audience. And I think by the Holy Spirit, it is encouragement for us to endure as well. 
Now I want to give you a little bit of review. You'll, let's get our, our, our bearings here. Where, we're, where are we at in the, the book of Hebrews? The author of Hebrews has been making a case like a lawyer throughout the book of Hebrews. He has demonstrated that, uh, that Jesus is greater, truer, and better in every way to the provisions of the Old Covenant. That what Jesus has brought with him and what he has accomplished, what he has inaugurated in the coming of the kingdom of God is so much better than what was provided in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, it all anticipated and pictured and prophesied and hoped in the time in which Jesus would arrive and begin to set up his kingdom. It was all looking forward to that. And so the author of Hebrews is making that case to these Hebrew Christians, this young church made up of Hebrews. He has said that Jesus is greater than the angels because he's the divine king, the son of God from Hebrews chapter 1. He said that Jesus is greater than Moses because while Moses was a servant of God, Jesus is indeed the son of God. He said that Jesus is greater than Joshua because Jesus brings a greater rest to the people of God than what Joshua brought from Hebrews 4. He said that Jesus is a greater priest from a greater priesthood than Aaron because he is is sinless and immortal and his sacrifice is good forever. It doesn't need to be repeated. But not only is Jesus better than any other human religious figure, he also has a better ministry. And after ushering in a better covenant built upon better promises with a better sacrifice, through Jesus, that is through his own life, the author of Hebrews now brings his readers to this conclusion. He says it, then in light of these truths, in light of these realities, we need to actually live in accordance with these truths. You see, his concern is that these Hebrew Christians will succumb to the pressures they are experiencing and go back to the deeply embedded traditions of Judaism that they grew up in. Remember, at that time, Christianity was relatively new. For Jewish people steeped in Old Testament truth, the pull towards tradition, the pull towards uh, the sacrificial system and the old covenant way of relating to God was strong. There were thousands of years of, of history, ingrained traditions, and a deep reliance upon the precision of the scriptures in giving the rules for how to come to God that they had grown up with. And this is why the author has been painstakingly showing them that the scriptures that they hold with such reverence, the the scriptures that they treasure have actually been pointing to the hope that they have in Christ Jesus all along. As we saw in Paul's sermon last week, the author is now beginning to press the point home with application. His logic goes something like this. If, if all that I've said about Jesus so far is true, what is the appropriate response? As a matter of fact, you can see that logic in the preceding verses in the text that Paul covered last week. Notice in verse 19, Therefore, brothers... Therefore, because of everything that I've said, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us, here comes the application, draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us, here's the application, hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us, here's the application again, consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, We broke this section up into two teachings, but I want you to realize this is one thought. He's continuing to apply 
what he has taught them from the first part of the book of Hebrews. This section now continues in the same line of logic. If all that I have shown you about Christ is true, what then is the appropriate response? Verse 26. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. I want to pause here for just a moment. This verse, when standing on its own, has struck fear in the hearts of Christians throughout the ages. Over the years of pastoring, this is one of those passages that has come up repeatedly with questions. In some circles, it get u- gets used as an attempt to sort of motivate holiness. The threat is if you can't break free from sin or some addiction, you're not really saved, or you can even lose your salvation. So I want to camp here for just a moment. I want to I help us think through this. Our outline for today is fairly simple. It's got three points, which should be a total shock to all of you. We hardly ever do only three points around here. That's way out of character for us. But here it goes. The title is A Call to Endure. In verses 26 to 31, there is a warning to endure. A warning to endure. In verses uh, 32 through, oh boy, I messed up my outline here. 32 through 32. Uh, a way to endure, and 33 to 39, a reason to endure. First of all, a warning to endure, a warning. Here comes the warning. If you go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. The problem with this verse is that, in a sense... Every sin is a willful sin. Every sin is a willful sin. When we sin deliberately, every sin is a deliberate sin. So then the issue becomes concerning for anyone who sins after receiving Christ. Is it saying here that if you sin after coming to Christ, that there is no sacrifice for that sin? That there is no covering for that sin. This is obviously very concerning because I don't know about you, how many of you have sinned after coming to Jesus? There's a few of us in this room. Okay. I wasn't expecting that. We'll try and work our way through this. Now listen, every sin is a deliberate sin and and just because you get saved doesn't mean you stop sinning. Matter of fact, the, the whole process of sanctification is growing in the likeness and character of Christ over the course of a lifetime where we're learning to fight and engage against sin to be at war with sin in our lives that's why we're encouraged in places like first John that we're to confess our sins and that if we do that he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins so it can't be saying here that it, that it that it's a sin after coming to Christ and and now it's not forgivable We need to ask a few questions of the text to begin to sort this out. First of all, the first question is, who is the we of verse 26? Who is the we of verse 26? He says, for if we go on sinning deliberately after having received the knowledge of the truth. By using the word we, the author includes not only himself, but the audience that he writes to. The ones that he is seeking to encourage. But there's also contained in that audience a subset, a group within that larger group that he is most concerned for. It is those who go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth. Now, remember, this comes on the heels of the three exhortations from last week where the author Said, the same, said to the same audience, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. 
Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works and not neglect to meet together as the day draws near. He is concerned with those who are not drawing near in full assurance of faith, those who are not holding fast their confession of faith, and those who have neglected or altogether abandoned fellowship with other believers in the body of Christ. That's the we that he's talking to. Okay, well then, what is the sin, the deliberate sin that he mentions? Well, fortunately for us, we don't need to go too far outside of the text because verse 29 gives us a description of that. Let's read it together, verse 29. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace. So this is not just a common sin. This is not just, you know, uh, lying or cheating or steal. This is actually something so much more severe and relevant to these discouraged Jewish Christians who, who are contemplating a retreat from distinctive Christianity. They're they're contemplating a return to Judaism with its sacrificial system and going back to the, the blood of bulls and of goats and of lambs as though those things can take away sin. He says, no, no. This deliberate sin is a turning your back on Jesus and all that he has provided John Calvin, in his commentary on the book of Hebrews, is helpful here. I'd like to read to you from from Calvin's commentary. It's a long quote, so just bear with me for a little bit. Those who sin, mentioned by the apostle, are not such as, as offend in any way, but such as forsake the church and wholly alienate themselves from Christ. For he speaks not here of this or that sin, but he condemns by name those who willfully renounce fellowship with the church. But there's a vast difference between particular fallings and a complete defection of this kind by which we entirely fall away from the grace of Christ. And as this cannot be the case with anyone except he has already been, he has been already enlightened he says if we sin willfully after that we've received the knowledge of the truth as though he had said if we knowingly and willingly renounce the grace which we had obtained and the apostle here refers only to apostates it's clear from the whole passage for what he treats of is this that those who had been once received into the church ought not to forsake it, as some who were wont to do. He now declares that there remained for such no sacrifice for sin because they had willfully sinned and after having received the knowledge of the truth. But as to sinners who fall in any other way, Christ offers himself daily to them so that they are to seek no other sacrifice for expiating their sins. He denies them that any sacrifice remains for them who renounce the death of Christ, which is not done in any offense except by a total renunciation of the faith. Let me summarize that. He's saying here, John Calvin is saying, listen, at issue here are those who abandon the faith, those who apostatize, who seek by some other means a way to justify themselves before God. There is no other sacrifice other than Christ that can accomplish that. And if you abandon coming to God by that means, and that means alone, then you are no longer under that sacrifice. That is a severe warning. Okay, so now we know that there are people in the midst of this target audience who are wavering in their faith, ready to give up on this whole Christian thing. There are even some who have abandoned the faith completely, who, who will never even hear those words that are being written here because they're not even in fellowship with the church. 
We recognize that this is to a mixed multitude. But with the heart of a pastor and with the the heart of a shepherd, the author is warning his audience to endure. He's saying to them, listen, if you walk away from Christ, you walk away from salvation. That's heavy. There is no other means by which you can be justified before God except Christ and Christ alone. Our only shelter, our only protection is through the provision of the gospel. And if you abandon the gospel, it no longer is provision for you. Okay. You know, I can remember a a couple of years ago when there were multiple high-profile people that were sharing their deconversion or deconstruction stories on social media. I remember how it rocked so many people in the church. And as a matter of fact, during that same season, you had the fall of multiple prominent Christian leaders. You have James McDonald and Ravi Zacharias and Mark Driscoll and a few prominent Hillsong pastors and Joshua Harris who completely abandoned his faith in Jesus. You have these these central Christian figures in the modern world, in the, the current culture, that many people had looked up to, read books from, went to conferences, listened to their teachings, downloaded their podcasts, and when they abandoned their faith or when they were caught up in severe sin, it rocked the Christian world. People began struggling. If, if, if Ravi Zacharias can fall away, can, can that happen to me? If... if if James McDonald or Mark Driscoll can blow up their lives and their, their, their usefulness to the kingdom of God, can that happen to me? There was a lot of fear. It shook many people. And, and, and I want you to see that that same reality is happening in this small Hebrew church in the book of Hebrews. This fledgling group of Hebrew Christians is seeing people fall away because of the hardship of following Christ. In the first century. Some were departing from fellowship and still others even denying the sacrifice of Jesus accomplished anything at all. And so now the author steps in as a loving friend or a father and he warns the rest of the saints there in this, this Hebrew church not to follow in their steps. If you move out from under the covering of Christ, you move out from under the protection of the gospel. That's the reality. Okay, well then, what are the consequences? Well, it tells us. Verse 27, there's a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Verse 28, Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now under the Old Testament law, there was provision for those who committed sins unintentionally. And upon realizing their sin, they could come and they could make sacrifice using an animal in order to make atonement for their sins. However, those who sin intentionally, or a a, a way that this is often phrased, you'll see this phrase pop up in the Old Testament, those who sin with a high hand, there was another provision for that category of person who was a, a sinner in that way, who had no regard for God, did not want to honor him, did not want to honor the covenant of God that he had made with his people. 
That provision was found in Numbers chapter 15, verses 30 and 31. It says this. But the person who does anything with a high hand, whether he is native or a sojourner, and not from the, the tribes of Israel, who reviles the Lord, and that person shall be cut off from his people because he has despised the word of the Lord and has broken his commandment, that person shall be utterly cut off his iniquity shall be upon him. So those who sin intentionally or with a high hand in complete rebellion against God and against his covenant had to be cut off from Israel because they had rejected the covenant of God, the covenant of Yahweh. And the consequence is that they are still under the judgment of their sin before God. Those who choose to reject Jesus' sacrifice also now continue to bear their own sin. The Old Testament indicates that those cut off from fellowship with Israel because of deliberate, repeated sins must bear their sin. And since they were cut off from God's people and not allowed to partake in the sacrificial system, that meant that there was no covering for their sin and they could not be forgiven until there was true and full repentance. They could not come under the provisions of the Old Testament if they were cut off from the priestly ministry. They would then still have to bear their sins. And he is saying, similarly, those who deny Christ after hearing the gospel do not have access to his sacrifice. It is not applicable to them because they have not accepted him. And the consequence is that they are still under the judgment of their sin before God. And here the author warns that this is something to fear. Essentially, he says, you have two options. You can either fall into the arms of a loving Savior, or you can fall into the hands of the living God. Those are the only two options. Either you fall into the arms of a loving Savior or you fall into the hands of the living God. I mean, look at the offense toward God if we reject the offering of his son on our behalf. When we, when we commit this deliberate, this willful sin here of rejecting Jesus' work on the cross as sufficient, Listen to what the author of Hebrews says in verse 29, how, how it is that God responds to that, how that affects him, what offense it is. He says, first of all, they have trampled the Son of God underfoot. If, if you reject Jesus, it's not just a matter of a, 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 a religious decision of I prefer this and not that. It's not like reality of, of, of God's existence is sort of this uh, buffet that we get to come and we go, well, I like this part of things, but I don't like that part of things. And so I'll, I'll take this and I'll reject that. No, listen, it's the gospel is the means by which we are saved. That is it. There is no other provision. That's the reality. And God has gone to great lengths to provide that to us. The second person of the Trinity is wholly invested, came down in human flesh, lived on earth as a part of his creatures suffered and died in our place, bore the consequence for our sin and for our iniquity, did battle with Satan himself, was raised from the dead, and by denying him, by rejecting the gospel through Jesus, we disgrace him by rejecting his greatest work. We devalue him by devaluing what he did. The strong language used here is purposefully selected in order to convey the sense of fearful outrage involved in forsaking Christ and returning to Judaism. You're trampling underfoot the Son of God. 
Do you know what an offense that is? Second thing he says, they have profane, profaned the blood of the covenant. That is, they've counted the blood of the covenant a common thing. If you reject Jesus as provision for sin and for forgiveness, the means by which you get to be a part of the kingdom of God, then you consider Jesus' blood of no greater importance, importance than the countless animals sacrificed under the old covenant. One scholar said this, Vincent, he said, here the word admits of two explanations, that Christ's blood was counted common, having no more sacred character or specific worth than the blood of an ordinary person, or two, that in refusing to regard Christ's blood as that of an atoner and redeemer, it is implied that his blood was unclean as being that of a transgressor. So get this in mind. Here's what he's saying. By profaning the blood of the covenant, you're saying the, blood, the, the spilled blood of Jesus has no value, has no meaning. That's what you're saying to God. Through rejection of the gospel, it is not just a, a question of preference. It is a huge offense to the sacrifice of God. So you're, you're saying, God might say, that the blood of my son is nothing? It counts for nothing? That all that I went through from eternity past, all that I have sacrificed is as nothing? How can that be true? Third offense, we have outraged the spirit of grace by rejecting the gospel by rejecting the work of Jesus, we offend the Holy Spirit whose purpose it is to present Jesus and his work to us according to John 16, verses 8 through 15. When we reject Jesus and his finished work on our behalf, we reject the voice of the Holy Spirit who is calling to us, be saved, be spared. And what can we expect? Well, we can expect justice. We can expect justice. Notice verse 30, for we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, and the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. This verse here quotes Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 35 and 36 emphasizing that God will severely judge those who reject his covenant. This applies also to the new covenant inaugurated by Christ as well. And that's what he's saying here. In, in the same way that those who stepped outside of the old covenant could expect God's judgment upon them, even more so those who reject Jesus, the Son of God, who profane his blood and his sacrifice, who reject the Holy Spirit and trample underfoot the Son of God, the expectation is that God's position towards them is one of justice. Okay? If you won't receive my mercy, then I will give you my justice. You know, in the same way, at this very moment, the people contained in this very room or those that are listening online, you have heard that Jesus has died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin. We know that we have been called to entrust our lives to him and to live as people under his authority and, and to surrender ourselves to him as savior and as king. And that presents every single one of us here with a choice. At this moment, right now, what will you do? Will you fall into the arms of a loving Savior? Or will you fall into the hands of the living God? 
Will you stand under the protection offered through the sacrifice of Jesus or will you stand on your own two feet with no sacrifice for sin? What will you do? The author of Hebrews tells his audience, cling to Jesus and don't let go. Keep hanging on to him. He is the one covering for sin. He is the once for all sacrifice. He is the greater, truer, better high priest. He is the one who has made a way to be in the presence of the living God. And you've been made a part of his kingdom through him. Don't let go of him because everything that you have gained comes through Christ. Now, in this next section, he turns towards encouragement. He encourages the readers with a way to endure, a way to endure. Verses 32 through 34, a way to endure. But recall the former days when you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so entreated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one, in verse 35 as well. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward." Notice the phrasing here. He says you were publicly exposed both to reproach and to affliction. The persecution that these Hebrew Christians had endured involved verbal abuse and acts of violence. And through this persecution, these believers participated in the sufferings of Christ in, in the same way that Jesus suffered for, for righteousness, for doing right. They also, through belief in Jesus and following Jesus, were suffering as a result of following in his footsteps. Then he says, also the seizure of your belongings. In first century A.D., Roman Empire, in, in the Roman Empire, authorities sometimes seized the, the property of accused criminals. And people also sometimes looted homes after homeowners were imprisoned, because when you were taken to prison, people had to bring you food and that sort of thing, and, and a lot of times people would go to the house and, and take whatever they wanted out of the house because you were in prison, you couldn't do anything about it anyway. And, and that's what was happening to these early believers. Now, we're a little out of touch with that in the Western world, aren't we? Belief in Jesus doesn't get you thrown in jail very often. But that is the reality that these first century Christians were, were facing. So paraphrasing what he's saying here, you did all of this because you believe that no matter what you lost here on earth, it would be worth it in eternity. You believe you had a better reward. No matter what you lost here on earth, you, you, th you believed in that moment, the reason you went to prison, the reason you had your house ripped off, the reason you suffered insults and physical abuse, the reason you did all of that is because you believed that there was a reward waiting for you in eternity, and no matter what happened here on earth, it could not take away that reality. Then he comes to the conclusion, therefore... Do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. If I, if I could sort of break down, contain this passage in a phrase, it would be this. Draw on past experience to gain strength for future endurance. Draw on past experience to gain strength for future endurance. Keep standing he is saying to them. You've done it before. And you can do it now. You endured then, you can endure now. You suffered then, you can suffer now. Keep standing. Don't let go of Jesus. Look back to what you've already gone through and let that strengthen your resolve in the present moment. 
to not shrink back, to not fall away, to not quit one foot in front of the other until you reach the top. On the way back from Mount Shasta this week, Tom, my father-in-law, was telling me the effect that hiking that mountain has had on him. He's summited uh, Shasta three times. Uh, each of the previous times were solo trips, so it was just him. He did, wasn't bringing anybody with him. It was just him toughing it out on the mountain to get to the top. And this is what he said. He said it, it, had, it had adjusted his scale in measuring what is hard. He said, you know, it's funny, after doing something that hard, you kind of look at everything else as doable. The next time you go and hike and, or you're working in the yard, you, you get tired, you'll think to yourself, well, it's not as bad as Shasta. If I've hiked Shasta, I can do this thing. I think the author here is doing something similar. He's saying, you've already done hard things. Keep hanging on. You can do it. Draw on past experience to gain future for strength, for future endurance. You know, isn't this also what Paul taught in Romans chapter 5? In Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, Paul says this. He says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. And no, let's pause right here. What? Rejoice in sufferings. I don't know about you, but sufferings suck. I don't like them. But Paul says here, he says, no, we rejoice in our sufferings. Why? Here's, here's the reason. Knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Here's what he's saying. Listen, when you go through hard things and you put your faith in Jesus, you make it through the hard thing and you go, Jesus was faithful. You get through that and you go, you know what? I can really count on the character of Jesus. Therefore, the next hard thing comes and you go, God got me through it last time. He'll get me through it this time too. You begin to hope in the character of God. Trust in his love for you. You don't want to quit. You don't want to give up. You don't want to throw your baton down and quit the race. You want to keep pressing on because you've got experience behind you that tells you that God is faithful. We can draw on our past experiences of hardship to endure in the present and future. The things we have been through are used by God to strengthen us for what we are going through and what we will go through. It builds over the course of life. And so, he says, listen, there's a way to endure. There's a way to endure. Let what you've already been through be the fuel that drives you to continue to endure right now. You've already had enough experience with God to know that he's faithful and you can trust him. And finally, in verses 36 to 39, he gives a reason to endure, a reason to endure. Verse, we'll back up to verse 35. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised for yet a little while. And the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but are of those who have faith and preserve their souls. What's the reason now to keep going? What's the reason to not give up? What's the reason to not throw away your confidence? Because Jesus is coming again. And there is an eternal reward for all those that have placed their trust in him. And don't 
give up. Here in this passage, the author quotes from the Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint. This time he quotes from Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. In Habakkuk, whose name means wrestler, he, he hears from the Lord that God intends to use the wicked to judge Israel. And as his name says, he is really wrestling with this idea. It bothers Habakkuk that God will use the wicked to judge the righteous, but, but he determines to go to the Lord with his wrestlings. He, he says, I'm going to set myself on my tower. I'm going to seek the Lord. I'm going to wait for what he will say to me in response because how can this be? How can God use the righteous or the, the wicked to judge the righteous? How can this happen? This is, this is not like God's character for him to do this. And then the answer comes from God. When the answer finally comes to him, the message is fairly straightforward. It's Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Here is essentially what God said to Habakkuk. Habakkuk, I know this doesn't make any sense to you. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. They are much, much higher. And there are some things, Habakkuk, that you cannot understand. And so you're going to have to live by faith. You are going to have to trust me. I'm God. And I've already demonstrated my love. I've already demonstrated my holiness, my righteousness, my perfection. And you are going to have to trust me even when you do not understand. Because those that are right with me, those that are justified by me, live trusting me regardless of what they cannot understand. It's interesting, in the New Testament, this verse from Habakkuk gets quoted three different times. It was something that the writers of the New Testament referred to and took courage and instruction from. Now, each time that it is quoted, there's a slightly different emphasis for each of those passages. It's quoted in Romans chapter 1, verse 17. The just shall live by faith. And the emphasis there is faith. Paul is making a case for salvation that comes by faith. And then in Galatians chapter 3, verse 11... Paul is making a case there in that passage for how a person is justified. They're justified by faith. And here in Hebrews 10, he's saying, and this is how the justified live. Romans 1 emphasizes faith. Galatians 3 emphasizes how people are justified. And Hebrews emphasizes how we live. Those who are justified by God live trusting Him. They live by faith. The author here is emphasizing how those who are justified by Christ should live. They should live by faith. Active and ongoing trust in God that is demonstrated through obedient action. Okay, let me say that again. Faith is active and ongoing trust in God that is, in, that is demonstrated through obedient action. This kind of faith does not shrink back. It trusts God. It moves forward. It puts one foot in front of the other until the summit. Now, after this passage, starting next week in Hebrews chapter 11, in the next chapter, the author is going to give a list of heroes of the faith who trusted God and walked in faith over the course of their entire lives. One of the great encouragements that come to us as Christians, as believers, through reading the scriptures, is this action right here, that our faith is encouraged. 
We're reminded that, that others have traveled the same journey that we have. And, and you might be 30, 40 years into your journey of faith, and there's the 70-year-old who's coming alongside of you, right? It's like, yeah, I've been up here a bunch of times. It's great up here. You might be just starting out. There's people who have gone before and you say, hey, there's going to be hard. It's a long hike. Sun's blistering. Your legs are going to get tired, but you can do it. You got it. You can make it to the top. It's so encouraging to read these stories of faith, to allow them to settle into our hearts and to hear that others have gone before us. We're reminded through their stories that the reward of faith is not the place you arrive, but the person you encounter. It's God himself. You know, perhaps you have recently heard of the death of one of the great pastors and Christian thinkers of our time, Tim Keller. He passed away on uh, May 19th. And he has been an incredible influence in my own life and so many others from my generation and beyond. Just a brilliant mind, a faithful witness to the grace of God. He was struggling with pancreatic cancer and finally succumbed on May 19th. But let me share with you his perspective on his own death. He said, this, and I quote him, these are his words, all death can do now to Christians is to make their lives infinitely better. The last message that he sent through his son on social media accounts was, was this. He said, I am thankful for all the people who have prayed for me over the years, and I'm thankful for my family that loves me. I'm thankful for the time that God has given me. But... I'm ready to see Jesus. I can't wait to see Jesus. Send me home. Jesus was his great reward. Jesus was his great reward. What's yours? Seriously. What's your reward? Comfortable life, fat retirement, resolved issues, no suffering. Listen, the greatest reward of all eternity is eternity with the risen Christ. And the author of Hebrews is speaking to his audience and he's speaking to us by the Holy Spirit today. Where have you put your hope? Is this life only satisfying to you if you get what you want? You have need of endurance because the greatest re reward of all eternity is eternity with the risen Christ. And today, may the knowledge that we will be with him for all of eternity give us a reason to endure all that life requires from a posture of faith. One foot in front of the other until we see Jesus. I love the old song. It's one we sang when I was a kid. I remember it from... When I was a child, I didn't even get saved until I was 19 years old, but I still remember singing this song growing up in church. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The world behind me and the cross before me no turning back, no turning back. 
Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. My cross I carry till I see Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Would you pray with me? What an incredible exhortation from your word this morning. How we need to hear it again and again. To put one foot in front of the other. No turning back. May your spirit strengthen us. May it revive the cold places of our heart. May it carry us, God, beyond the mere passing fancy of enthusiasm and carry us forward into endurance to be those who live with you as our great reward knowing that we please you offering you our lives in service and obedience worshiping you from the heart in everyday life one foot in front of the other Till we see you face to face. In the name and for the glory of Jesus. Amen.